Okay, so I'm pleased to introduce Remy Reboulet from Institute Fourier. He's going to talk about the Chandra transform, convex bodies, and plurisubharmonic metrics. Okay, so first of all, uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so as is apparently required by the uh, theme of the seminar, I'll try to uh, not say things that are too hard at the start, so I'll try to go into tray geometry and explain things as uh, nicely as I can, and hopefully uh, you'll be fine. And don't hesitate to uh, you know, just uh, tell me or ask me a question if, uh, if there is an issue. Thank you. So, uh, so as I said, I'll begin with some uh, notions of toric uh, geometry and in particular uh, toric part potential theory. So we'll start with the uh, very basic stuff. Um, so the setting for this section is going to be that we're going to take X, uh, a smooth predictive uh, variety, which we ask to be toric, uh, which means that there is a dense open action of a, uh, of a torus, so C star to the power of D. And uh, D is going to be the dimension of my variety. So it is a, a maximal rank torus. And I'll pick L to be a uh, torus equivariant uh, ample line bundle on my variety X. <coughs> And the first uh, thing I'm going to talk about is the correspondence between um, lattice polytopes, so polytopes with integer points, uh, well, integer uh, uh, edges, I don't remember the English word, um, and between polarized trig varieties. Uh, so uh, a lot of this section is going to be presenting some uh, correspondence of this type. And, the second part of this talk is going to be explaining how we can uh, generalize these correspondences as well as we can hope to. Um, so uh, if you have this data of a uh, direct variety with an uh, equivalent ample line bundle, we can associate to it uh, a lattice polytope uh, in the following way. Um, so the first thing that we have to notice is that it induces an action uh, so the torus section induces an action on each uh, space of sections of uh, the tensor powers of L. So I use additive notation here. So KL is the uh, kth tensor power uh, of L. And in turn, this induces a uh, weighted composition of the space of sections according to the uh, one-dimensional representations. Uh, so I'm going to denote uh, the set of weights by MK because we're dealing with the degree K here. Uh, and so we can decompose uh, our space of sections as uh, the sum of uh, this uh, C K alpha. And so these weights are going to be uh, in ZD. Uh, so we are going to have a collection of points in ZD, which we can uh, actually notice, uh, like the number of these weights is exactly the dimension of uh, H0 KL. And we can take their convex hole uh, inside Rd, and this is going to define naturally a, uh, a polytope. So, and lattice polytope, so a polytope with integral point with integral uh, vertices was the word I was looking for, um, uh, because these points are in Zd. That's the definition of the lattice polytope. Uh, conversely, we can uh, go the other way around, and if we pick a lattice polytope in Rd, we can reconstruct. Uh, a polarized rate variety. So, okay, this is not supposed to jump so easily, but okay. Um, well, let's just do this one sentence at a time. Uh, so first to have the underlying variety, we're just going to take uh, the closure of the image of uh, the uh, torus. So C star to the power of D. Um, inside the productivization of the direct sum of uh, the integer points of the K Minkowski sum of your polytope uh, intersected with ZD. So we just take the uh, integral points of K times your polytope. Uh, this gives a set of uh, well, integer vectors. Uh, we can take the direct sum of C with respect to, to these, uh, these vectors. And uh, by sending a uh, coordinate z inside your torus to uh, z m0, or m0 is going to be the first element in the set, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We, uh, 
so we can sort of embed it into this proactivization and we take the closure of its image and that's how we recover the uh, the toy variety uh, and so we did this uh, on the cave uh, Minkowski some of your uh, polytopes so uh, by restricting the O of one to this uh, to this image uh, to this straight variety we get what we call uh, k times the line bundle uh, l delta and so if we did this just with uh, k equals one we'd get what we call the line bundle l, l delta in this sense uh, so this gives all tensor powers of them basically and so um, the main first theorem that we're going to have is that uh, there is an actual one-to-one -one correspondence if you fix a dimension d between um, trait varieties of dimension d and those with an ample torus invariant, a torus equivariant line bundle, and uh, between uh, uh, lattice polytopes in R D. So uh, these these constructions are really inverse to each other. Now <clears throat> we're going to get into the more uh, analytic aspects of this. So we're going to define uh, our basic objects to do cry potential theory on trick manifolds or trick varieties. Uh, so we pick uh, X and L as before. And we say that a, a continuous metric pi on L is going to be price of harmonic if its curvature current is positive. So I'm going to denote it by the DC pi. Uh, and again, can I, okay, cool. So only the first pose works for whatever reason. Um, and so, okay, you, you can think of this as a generalized convex function or convex metric in a sense, um, because this condition that have, of having the DC phi uh, be positive is a generalization of the condition of having, for example, the second derivative of a function be positive in the C2 case. Uh, so this is a sort of generalization uh, that works really well of uh, the notion of convexity, except that you not only can it work in uh, in domains of C to the power of D, but also in general uh, manifolds, and it also extends to uh, to metrics on line bundles. So we're going to denote uh, PSH of XL for the uh, set of PSH metrics on L, and we're going to denote by PSH T of XL the set of torus invariant uh, PSH metrics. Uh, so we're going to build. Uh, again, a new correspondence, um, uh, which will be between essentially convex functions and polytopes and uh, torus invariant PSH metrics on polarized toric varieties. So we pick phi to be a continuous torus invariant PSH metric on L. And for, uh, okay, to make things easier, we'll just assume that zero is in the interior of the polytope. Uh, to translation, we can do this. And by the previous correspondence, our point zero is going to correspond to a section uh, of L, which I'm going to denote by uh, S0, uh, so a torus invariant section. And we're, so to associate to this phi a uh, convex function in the polytope, we're going to do this in two steps. So first, if we pick again coordinates uh, z1, et cetera, zd on the torus inside x, <coughs> we uh, we define a function, uh, which I'm going to call phi log on rd uh, in the following way. Uh, so phi log uh, evaluated against the log of the absolute values of these coordinates here is going to be defined to be equal of minus to be equal to minus log of uh, s zero squared of z, and in fact this is well defined uh, because of the torus invariance. So the, the fibers of this uh, log map with which we compose are just uh, products of circles, and you can see that uh, this map is in fact in independent on the choice of the uh, of uh, points z one etc z d with a given uh, image by this log map. So this is all well defined. And um, then the second thing that we're going to do is that we're going to take its genre transform. So for those of you who are not very familiar with the uh, so with this tool from convex analysis, it's basically um, 
a procedure that takes a convex function and turns it into another convex function, which is going to be defined on its gradient or its subgradient, depending on the irregularity of your convex function, uh, which has uh, well, origins in physics. But uh, okay, this doesn't really matter for what we're doing. You can uh, take this definition uh, for granted. So we're going to uh, define C phi of uh, a point P. I'm not yet saying where it lies. Uh, to be equal to the supremum over all uh, x in Rd of the uh, inner product of P and x minus phi log of x. So, uh, so I'm saying my convex analysis magic um, because as I've, I've briefly mentioned, so the Legendre transform of a convex function is defined um, on its set of gradients. And this uh, Atiyah Gilman Sternberg theorem here says that the gradient of this uh, function, phi log, is actually a polytope. Um, and this function is going to be minus infinity outside of this polytope. And oops, and it's uh, exactly the, uh, the polytope delta XL that we defined before. Um, and because the original transform turns convex functions into convex functions, we then obtain a, uh, a convex function defined on the polytope associated to our polarized rate variety. And it is also continuous if the original metric is continuous. So we have done the first, uh, the first part of this construction. I'm not really going to go into the uh, other way around, but basically you can inverse this regional transform to get a function like this, and then you can just lift it uh, invariantly with respect to the uh, torus section to get back a PSH continuous metric on L. Uh, and so the second uh, correspondence I'm going to present today uh, is saying that there is exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence between continuous torus invariant PSH metrics on L and uh, continuous convex functions on the polytope associated to L. Uh, so, as I say, we're going to try to generalize the results later on to more general situations uh, as best as we can. Uh, and this is one of the theorems we're going to be looking at. Um, and to finish, so a last little bit of potential theory for the prerequisites is the notion of a uh, PSH geodesic. So, um, well, this might seem weird at first if you're not used to it because the set of, uh, for example, PSH metrics as a natural, uh, let's say continuous PSH metrics as a natural open convex structure. And so there are, there are just natural geodesics given by, uh, by genuine segments between metrics. But for historical reasons, we're not going to be interested in uh, this naive notion of geodesic. So um, in the in the setting of the Yotian Dawson conjecture, for example, or just more generally the search for uh, nice metrics, um, we have this uh, k-energy functional, which is a, a so a function uh, on PSH XL or some smaller subset of this uh, that associates to such a metric, a real value. And um, it is what we call an Euler Lagrange uh, functional for uh, what is known as the constant scalar curvature KR equation. So the critical points of this K energy functional are going to be. Uh, CSCK metrics, a metric with some, that satisfies some very important PD convex geometry. Um, and so for the variational approach to solving such equations, we're going to want to show that uh, this energy is going to be convex along certain geodesics. And that is, for example, coercive in a certain sense, so that there exists a, min a minimizer. minimizer. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, if there is a minimizer, then there is a solution to the uh, PDE. Uh, but so uh, this K energy is not convex along these naive uh, affine segments, but is geodesic with respect to, uh, is convex with respect to geodesics um, defined by slightly more complicated uh, initially Riemannian structure. Uh, but this is just a hist historical uh, viewpoint on this. We're not going to need this. 
Uh, for our purposes, we can just know that the uh, geodesy joining two continuous PCH matrix phi zero and phi one is given as the uh, supremum of all parisobharmonically varying segments uh, T maps to phi T, such that the endpoints are uh, bounded by the uh, matrix phi zero and phi one respectively. So uh, taking the supremum of all this and regularizing it actually, uh, gives you a uh, what we call a PSH geodesic. And again, so there is a nice correspondence which uh, says that uh, so uh, there is a bijection between the sets of uh, PSH geodesics uh, of torus invariance matrix and L and genuine affine segments of continuous convex functions on uh, the polytope associated to L through this uh, uh, operation of the Legendre transform as before. So the geodesic joining phi zero and phi one is sent to uh, one minus t times the c phi zero that we had before plus t uh, times c phi one that we had before. And conversely, if you have a uh, an affine segment like this of convex functions on the polytope, you can turn it into a PSI geodesic. This is very nice. And so, okay, so I like there is a, a bit more dry potential, but we're nearing the end of the, uh, the prerequisites. Um, the, the last quantity that I'm going to, uh, to mention is the Mongean pair energy, which might seem absolutely horrible, um, but it doesn't matter that we really know the, uh, the full expression. So basically, this, is, uh, this can be seen as an other Lagrange uh, functional for the uh, Mongean pair equation, T max to the DC phi D, basically. Uh, so uh, let's just break down the expression. It's simply uh, a weighted sum of the integrals of phi zero minus phi one. So the energy of phi zero against phi one. Um, integrated against all possible mixed uh, measures involving uh, phi zero and phi one. So this is why I call the Mongean pair energy. Uh, if you know a bit of classical potential theories, it's just a uh, multivariate generalization of this. Um, and this is a quantity that's very nice because, for example, it detects uh, PSH geodesics in the sense that a, um, a PSH segment is geodesic if and only if the Mongean pair energy is affine among these segments. So this is a very important quantity. Um, by, Whose importance you might just want to accept if you if you're not convinced. And um, <clears throat> a last very nice result regarding this uh, Legendre transform is that it linearizes the motion energy in the sense that uh, there exists a uni universal constant depending only on the dimension d, such that uh, the energy of phi zero against phi one is just the c times the integral over the polytope of the difference of the transforms of uh, phi one and phi zero against the normalized Lebesgue the measure. So we've transformed this uh, really complicated, uh, it's really complicated expression which involves just this very nonlinear expressions into this very simple and linear uh, uh, expression. So this is a very powerful result actually. And there are other nice functionals they, they have a good trade versions of, but we're not going to get into this uh, in this talk. And so uh, what we're going to try to do for now is to uh, generalize these results as best as possible to uh, the case of a uh, non-toric polarized variety. So uh, the equivalent of the polytope is going to be the Okunkov body, and then we're going to define this uh, generalized horizontal transforms. Uh, so we'll get into this uh, right now. So again, sorry, this is supposed to uh, to be step by step, so you have a lot of information at the same time. So let's just try to follow my mouse and uh, do this uh, sentence after sentence. So. The first thing that we're going to do is to do, generalize the notion of a polytope associated to a polarized ring variety. So this is a construction that originates from an idea of uh, Andrei Okunkov, and so the name uh, of Okunkov body, and that's been systematically developed by um, Ladersfeld and Mustatsa, as well as uh, Kave Komansky. Uh, so a version of this construction is the one that I'm going to present here. 
So we fix, as, uh, as promised, just a smooth complex proactive variety with no symmetries, with no torus actions of dimension D, and we pick an ample line bundle L on it. And we're going to pick any point uh, P in X. Um, and so if you expand a section of uh, a power of L uh, in local coordinates near P, you can represent it as a uh, power series. Uh, so a sum of A alpha Z to power K alpha with alpha in ND. And we simply define a, a evaluation on this all possible uh, se uh, sections of, of tensor powers of L, so on the section of algebra of L. Um, so this is simply the usual uh, ZL evaluation. So uh, the evaluation of a section S is going to be the minimum of the alpha appearing in this expression such that the coefficient A alpha is non-zero. Uh, and so this is a minimum which is taken with, uh, with respect to any monomial total order on ND, uh, which is just a generalization of the notion of the lexicographic order. So you can uh, you can simply imagine that this is the lexicographic order. So in my notation, um, I do not make apparent the fact that we have made a lot of implicit choices, we have uh, made the choice of an order and we have made the choice of a point, but um, this doesn't really matter. You can, you get objects that are essentially equivalent if you change these choices. So we're just going to denote this evaluation by new. Uh, and so the important point is that it's a valuation like function um, that has rank D in the sense that it takes values in MD. So, um, what we're going to do next, uh, in what we're going to do next, this comes up. Uh, so we define for all k the set of sigma group points in degree k of L with respect to this valuation to be simply the image of all sections of KL uh, against this valuation. So again, just as before, uh, the number of points that we obtain is in fact just the uh, dimension of the space of sections. Uh, so through this, we obtain as before just a, a set of points in, uh, in uh, ND. And we define the Lecomte of body as the closure of the convex hole of the union of all these sigma uh, groups, or sigma group points that we rescale. So the rescaling makes it so that we are basically uh, putting all points around the same place. Otherwise, we just will have something infinite. So uh, for all K, we uh, look at all the possible images against this valuation of the sections of KL. We scale them by one over K and we take the convex hull of this. And what we obtain is, um, is a convex body. So it is a uh, compact, closed compact set uh, with no empty interior. Uh, sorry, uh, convex compact set most importantly. And this is why I define to be the Oconcov body of, uh, of uh, XL. So again, this depends on this valuation, which depends on uh, data of a point and an order on ND. But uh, basically, if you change these things, the Oconcov body that you obtain is just going to uh, be different in, uh, let's say, trivial ways. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question? Is there Sure. Uh, is there, because here you only get the convex body, not the polytope necessarily. Yes, yes. Are there easy examples where you where you don't get a polytope by something? Uh, actually, most of the time. <laughs> okay. Almost almost all the time you don't get a polytope. So whenever you're not on a toric manifold. Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, it can really, like the, the boundary of this body can, can be really arbitrarily bad. I mean, it can be absolutely awful, so you can't integrate on the boundary, for example. Right. So a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, work in the field is also to try to understand when the Okunkov body is nice, in a way. Okay. It's a very non-trivial question. <laughs> so on the heels of that, may I ask uh, sure. another question? Is it known when it's uh, the... Okunkov body is a polytope. Um, I I don't think that there would be a general result. Um, I think there are some partial results that you might find in the work of uh, Alex Coronia, for example, and Catherine McLean, who I'm uh, mentioning after this. Uh, but I'm 
as far as I know, I'm not aware of any results where this where you can actually check if it's an actual void there. And, and uh, perhaps another smaller one, mm -hmm. making sure you don't uh, go off track. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it known what uh, convex bodies can be Okunkov bodies? Yes. Uh, that's a paper actually that I'm going to mention just at the end of this slide. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so I can start with this example then because it's uh, the relevant one. So, the key point is that the response is no longer invariable. So, uh, if I have a convex body, I can't immediately tell uh, if it is uh, the Okunkov body of some polarized variety, uh, nor can I usually tell if it's unique, if there is one. Um, and the best result that we know in this direction is this result of Kronia, Luzovanu, and McLean, which uh, says that actually the set of convex bodies that are Okunkov bodies uh, is countable. And uh, as you can imagine, there are many more than probably many possibilities uh, in general uh, of convex bodies. So of course, uh, basically none of them are think of bodies. And I do not remember exactly uh, how deep they go in the paper, but I think you can at least have some, if you look at it, there are some characterizations of when uh, a convex body is an a of body. Um, so the, the, uh, the example to tie in with what we discussed before is that in the trade case, uh, so everything is exact in a, certain, in a certain sense. We deal with data at order one, but the important torus invariant sections are defined at order one. So the set of CMA group points is just the set of weights of the, uh, of the torus action. And if we pick the correct order, so in this case, it matters a little bit, uh, we recover exactly the uh, toric polytope uh, from the, the first section. So uh, at least it recovers the construction that we know in when it should, which is nice. Um, and so now we're going to be looking into uh, generalizing the Legendre transform construction. So this is uh, based on the work of David Wittgenstein. Um, so. We begin with picking uh, phi a continuous PSH metric on, on L. So again, there are no more assumptions on X and L uh, than just uh, you know, the usual ones. And so the, the, the key point is that to phi, you can associate uh, different norms on spaces of sections of tensor powers of L. So you can define a sub norm uh, whose square is just so the square evaluated against the section S is just the supremum of S squared against E minus K pi uh, over X. Uh, you can also associate to it an L2 norm. If you pick a smooth volume form U on X, uh, so the square of uh, this norm evaluated at S is the integral of S squared against the E minus K pi uh, d mu. Uh, and so we're going to use these norms to construct our generalizers on our transform. Um, and due to a, a simplification of David, actually, we can just use either norm in the construction that follows. So for uh, notational convenience, I'm just going to write norm k phi instead of specifying uh, either a volume form or supremum. Um, so the first part of this construction involves uh, defining an affine space of uh, monomial sections of KL in a sense. So if we pick a sigma group on alpha uh, in degree K, so just the uh, evaluation of a section against this valuation that we had, uh, we define the space GRK alpha uh, to be uh, the set of sections of KL such that in local coordinates near your points, it, uh, it has a monomial lowest order term. Uh, so you can actually see this in, in, uh, as a class in a quotient space. Uh, so yeah, this is just a space of monomial sections uh, in KL such that the evaluation uh, of S is equal to alpha, which is our semi group point. So this is what we define as zero K alpha. And to define our generalized Legendre transform, we proceed as follows. Uh, so for all k, we first define uh, a function ck on the CMI group, 
uh, degree k. So to an alpha in the semi group, we define ck phi of alpha to be uh, uh, the log for conventional reasons of uh, the infimum over this affine space of monomial sections of uh, the evaluation of the uh, such a monomial section uh, against our norm associated to phi in degree k, uh, which you can see as, uh, again, the log of a quotient norm uh, induced by uh, uh, this norm k phi on the affine space of sections from before. And we're going to just take all the values of all the CKs. And if you scale them, so there should be a K minus one here. If you scale them, this defines a, uh, a natural uh, set of points on all the uh, semi points in the concave body. And you take the convex hull of these points which you can see immediately is a convex function, uh, C phi on the concave body. Um, and the key point is that this uh, naturally generalizes the Lejeune transform uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, we have these two properties that we recover from the trade case. Uh, so first, yeah. It is, it corresponds to the usual Lejeune transform of a torus invariant SH metric. Uh, if you have a torus action on Excel, and if you've made the uh, choice of the lexicographic order uh, in your evaluation. And again, it linearizes the motion per energy, which is a very, very uh, strong result. Um, so again, the energy of phi 0 against phi 1 is just this universal constant times the integral on the Oconcov body, on the interior of the Oconcov body. Of the difference of these uh, generalized regional transforms of phi one uh, minus phi zero uh, against the normalized Lebesgue measure on the open curve body. Uh, so this is a very very essential result, and it's uh, in a certain sense a bit surprising that it works so well, given that, for example, uh, again the, the, you can't invert the correspondence between convex functions and the open curve body and PSH metrics, so you can't really go back. Uh, so having this is actually very, very strong. Um, and so the first result of mine I'm going to present in this talk. Um, Can I ask you just a quick question before we move yeah. on? Um, so it seems that the that this is um, injective, this transform in the sense that the transform of a continuous pluris harmonic metric is determined, determines the metric, am I right? Um, I, I'm not so sure. Um, I mean, I, I think it might be possible so that the fibers of this map are, are uh, not you know, single tons. I mean, you, you can't you lose a lot of information by doing this. You lose all the high or, or information that's two degree higher than one, two order higher than one. So um, right, I see. In the Tory case, it's one to one, but there we have we have a lot of symmetry as well. Well, here we don't have a lot of symmetry at all. Is the thing in general. So um, we all the we, we basically try to project onto something that's symmetric, but uh, by doing this, we lose a lot of things. So right, uh, that, that's why this is a very strong result. Is because uh, we can still recover some very essential information even though we lost uh, a lot of things. Because the emotional energy is also, in a certain sense, just information of two order one. Um, so another thing that you can do, uh, which is my uh, my result here, is that you can also uh, linearize geodesics as before uh, in the following sense, uh, or rather detect geodesicity. So if you pick a PCH segment uh, T maps to phi T joining phi zero and phi one which are continuous and PSH and L. Then you have an equivalence between the statement that uh, phi t is geodesic and that the transform of phi t is an affine function of t as before. So this is again a result that tells you that even though you lose some information to this transform, you can still uh, at least partially go back. So you can't necessarily reconstruct a uh, PSH geodesic from an affine function like this. Uh, but you can tell whether uh, a segment is geodesic uh, by looking at it. And this is uh, an equivalent. So this is 
basically the best sort of result that we could expect in this generality. Uh, so I'll say a few words about the idea of the proof. Um, so again, sorry for assaulting you with uh, this much information at once. Um, so step by step, um, if we pick a smooth volume form on X as before, uh, the endpoint metrics define norms uh, as before. So the S, uh, K phi I for I equals zero one, which are just the integrals, uh, so the L2 uh, norms associated to uh, phi zero and phi one. Um, and so what we can do is that uh, these are two Hermitian norms. And so it's a classical theorem from uh, spectral analysis that uh, you can always find a basis which is uh, orthonormal for the first norm and orthogonal for the second norm. So we're going to do just this now. Uh, we're going to denote this basis by uh, SJ. And using this basis, we can define for all T a sort of a, sort of a segment of norms. Uh, which I'll denote by norm kt. So at all t, uh, this norm kt is a unique uh, norm which is orthogonal uh, with respect to the basis at j, and at which we prescribe the values. Uh, so sorry, this is for all j here. Uh, so against an element of this basis, uh, the value of the norm, there is no square here, is uh, just the uh, value of the norm at time one. To the power of t. So this you can really see this as a genuine segment of norms, uh, sort of log affine segment of norms in a certain sense. And the key point is that this is uh, this norm kt is not equal to the L2 norm associated to uh, k phi t who had done this. Uh, sorry, uh, this is the uh, so if this worked, we wouldn't have to do anything at all. Uh, but this is absolutely not true at all. Uh, so this segment, we we don't really know how we, uh, it's really difficult to work with it. And this segment is really easy to work with. So we like to have it. And then we can just take this Bergman kernel and uh, turn it into a metric, uh, which I'm going to write phi tk, which is just k minus one times the log of, uh, Sorry, this is a sum. I am I am too used to the Archimedean stuff. Uh, this is a sum of the SJ squares uh, of e minus t log of the uh, so the exponential of the log of this essentially. Uh, so this is just a weighted Bergman kernel. Uh, or uh, if you are used to this notation, it's just the Fubini issue the metric associated to this uh, norm uh, kt. Uh, so this gives this metric, and there is a fundamental theorem of Berenson that says that you can approximate geodesics with these segments uh, phi tk uh, uniformly uh, in time and space. So the uh, C0 norm of phi tk minus phi t uh, on x times 0, 1 uh, actually goes to 0 as uh, k goes to infinity. So we have a uniform approximation of a PSA geodesic uh, using these Bergman segments, basically. Uh, and this is a very, very strong and important theorem. And that's why I use in, in the proof of my results. Uh, so roughly this, uh, this takes place in three steps. So the first thing that we do is that um, we define an, a second uh, Legendre transform uh, tilde C of phi t which we compute by using these, uh, these Bergman norms instead of using just the uh, usual all two sub norms. Um, and so the first thing that we do is that we show that this uh, transform here is going to be uh, larger than the uh, original original transform. At the end, they'll turn out to be the same. So we have this really specific transform that just works along geodesics basically. Uh, and so to show this inequality, we used uh, the uniform uh, convergence result of Benson, uh, because basically we're going to use the characterization of this C phi t using the sub norms. And so having these uniform estimates uh, turn into uh, estimates for the sub norms as well. 
Um, the second thing that we do is that we show a formal uh, estimate, which is not a convexity, it's just uh, well, convexity at the endpoints. So we show that this uh, new transform is uh, at time t is more than uh, the segment of the original transform of phi zero. And uh, so the segment training, the original transform of phi zero and the original transform of phi one. And so the key point here is that this is a, because these Bergman norms are easy to work with, we can prove this rather easily. Um, and combining with this with the first point, uh, so uh, that this is more than this, then this gives that uh, this is more than this. Um, so this is a, a formal estimate. It's not, we have not proved convexity of this, unfortunately. Um, and then we just integrate. And uh, so by the results of David, we know that uh, the integral of this is going to be so in a certain sense, this is going to give a, a difference of normal energies. And here, uh, this is also going to give a difference of normal energies. And because phi t is geodesic, the normal energy is going to be a fine um, along phi t. So the integral of this is going to be a fine. And we're going to see that uh, uh, basically the integrals of these two functions, which are comparable, uh, are going to uh, be the same. So this implies that these uh, two functions are actually the same, uh, which uh, basically shows the proof. So uh, I'll try to go as uh, nicely and non-painfully into the Norcanadian uh, aspects of this. So uh, sorry, do, how much time do I have left? You got uh, 17 minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, do, you, so, do you mind? So maybe maybe a 16, because I would actually like you to just go back to the statement of the theorem just one more time, yes, very quickly. Uh, this one. Uh, is that the one you presented the proof of? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you, yes. Um, perfect, thank you. Yeah, I got it. Okay. That's fine, thanks. Uh, so, Basically, um, you can, if you're a bit scared of the word Narcamedian, you can just uh, understand that it's going to be uh, a way to capture the singularities of test configurations or generalized test configurations. So if we, if we begin with picking what we call an ample test configuration for XL, uh, which, I'm, which is a data of a, a flat projective family uh, currently X, uh, fiber over A1 uh, with a relatively ample line bundle uh, curly L uh, with respect to this pi, uh, which we end up with a sister action lifting the usual action C and identifying the fiber at one with our original XL. So this is what we define to be a test configuration. Mm. And by the work of Funk Storm, um, they show how to uh, sort of canonically associate to this data a uh, price of Ramanic geodesic ray. So uh, it's like a PSX uh, geodesic segment, except that we go to infinity here. Uh, and the geodesicity condition just means that on any compact interval uh, in the whole line, uh, the restricted segment is also geodesic. Uh, so that's uh, okay. That, that was written anyway. Um, and the way that they Constructed is using so Bergman arrays, which is basically uh, the array version of these segments that we constructed uh, when we looked at the result of Benson. Uh, so uh, this uh, geodesic array associated to uh, XL, so curly L, I'm going to denote by uh, big phi curly L. Uh, so I'll try to not get you lost too much in the uh, in the notation. So for the Norcamedian uh, things, uh, so basically it's dates back to work of uh, Berman, Buxom, and Jonsson, and also uh, Sav and, and others. Uh, so given an array uh, like we had before uh, associated to a test configuration, uh, we associate to it a Norcamedian metric phi and a curly L. 
on an object which is uh, called the Berkowitz identification uh, of X, uh, which I'm going to denote by X and uh, so with respect to the true absolute value on C. So to, to say a few words about this construction, uh, basically XN is uh, a way to compactify the set of divisorial valuations on X as a genuine uh, analytic space in a sense. Uh, so the, the underlying uh, set of points is just um, the set of valuations on function fields of um, irreducible varieties of X with the uh, topology of pointwise convergence. And with respect to this uh, topology of pointwise convergence, uh, the uh, set of divisorial valuations lying over X, uh, so associated to uh, birational modes of X, is dense uh, in this space XN. So this is a, a very specific case of a more general construction um, that works for any variety defined over a, uh, a normed algebra, for example. Um, so we analytify with respect to uh, the trivial absolute value on C, such as the absolute value, uh, which is one everywhere except at zero. Uh, if we did this construction with respect to the um, usual uh, absolute value on C, the one that we all know, then we just get the analytication of X in the sense of cell, so the uh, analytic space associated to X. Uh, but so basically, uh, when I'm going to speak of XN, you can just remember that it's basically just a, a compactified set of divisorial valuations. Um, and that's really the only uh, subset of it that we care about. So to define this, um, this function phi at curly L uh, and A, we, we just basically define it on this set of divisor divisorial valuations and extended by density. Um, so given a divisorial valuation, we basically uh, lift it to a valuation uh, on the test configuration in, in a certain sense. Uh, and we define uh, this evaluated at this valuation to be a generic neural number uh, against this uh, lifted divisorial valuation, which corresponds to a lifted divisor. Uh, so a neural number uh, can be seen as a sort of uh, analytic order of vanishing, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, and so there is a more general construction which associates to any PSH array, not even geodesic or not even of the type that we had before, a function uh, phi and a. Uh, so basically, you can think of this construction as uh, capturing the, the singularities of phi t as you approach the the central fiber of any test configuration for your initial variety. Uh, so what, this is what we're going to call a uh, Archimedean PSH function on X on. So L PSH function because it comes from L. Uh, okay, uh, so if, it's, if this is a bit confusing, this doesn't matter. It's, it's mostly to just uh, explain uh, the objects, but uh, you can take this for granted as well, if you wish. Um, so among these PSH rays, there are some particularly nice and important rays, <clears throat> which we're going to call uh, maximal. So we say that array big phi is maximal if it is the largest in a class of uh, all PSH rays, which begin uh, at the same uh, initial metric or below it uh, as your array. And if uh, they define it, uh, so, okay, so this is a class of rays uh, which begin below uh, phi, and we have the same uh, Norakimedian function uh, as your ray phi. Uh, so you can see this as having uh, singularities prescribed by, uh, by phi. Um, so basically, uh, to make a maximal ray, you just take the supremum, or in a certain sense, uh, the regularized supremum of this class of metrics. Uh, and what you obtain is essentially a array that has uh, optimal singularities uh, in the sense that they're uh, no worse than those of uh, phi. They're, uh, yeah. And what's nice is that the, you, you can use them to really, um, to really uh, capture the slopes of infinity of some functionals. So as I mentioned before, there is this uh, conjecture uh, which is partially no longer a conjecture, which uh, relates 
uh, so which would relate the, um, the existence of, for example, a CSCK metric and um, the positivity of uh, some object which would be purely algebraically defined. Um, and this is these rays are a way to make this bridge. Uh, because as we suspect, for example, the slope at infinity of the KRNG uh, along a maximal uh, ray is exactly the Narcomedian uh, KRNG of the associated uh, PSH, Narcomedian PSH function. Uh, so you can actually, uh, well, we know this in, in certain cases, and if we know this in all cases, then we can prove y to d, basically. Um, so this Narcomedian KRG is constructed by an uh, intersection theory uh, that I really don't want to get into right now. Um, but it's basically uh, integrating the, so the entropy part of this functional is going to be integrating the uh, log discrepancy function against uh, a Narcomedian non measure associated to your uh, initial metric, uh, to your Narcomedian uh, metric. Uh, but so anyway, uh, what matters uh, for, our talk, which does not deal with YCD at all, is that uh, so we can solve this envelope problem. So uh, if we pick a continuous Narcomedian function uh, phi and a coming from L, then there exists a unique maximal geodesic ray uh, emanating from phi zero, so which starts at phi zero, and with the given uh, singularity data. Uh, and as a particular case, the rays of von Sturm that I mentioned before are maximal. Uh, okay, so this is just an exposition. Um, you, you, you can think of these rays are really uh, rays with uh, optimal singularities and uh, which make the bridge between uh, complex and Archimedean data, essentially. Uh, and so the last result that I'm going to mention here, and I won't attempt to prove it, um, so basically by doing essentially the same thing from the work of Buxom Chen and then uh, generalized by Chen McLean, uh, you can define a generalized Le Chandre transform uh, for Narcomedian PSH uh, functions or metrics as well. And um, in the, the last result basically says that, um, so if we pick phi to be a geodesic ray, then it is maximal in the sense of before, if and only if, um, so it's transformed on the Oconcov body is a fine. So this is uh, anyway given by geodesicity, uh, but the maximality is given by the fact that uh, its slope, so the slope of the transform is going to equal the Narcomedian uh, transform of the associated uh, Narcomedian metric. So it's going to be of the form uh, C of phi zero, plus t times uh, c and a uh, of phi and a, basically. So this is a way to see this Narcomedian limit as a genuine uh, affine limit in a certain sense. Uh, so this uh, both, so this gives more insight into the fact that this maximal ray is uh, really realized in Narcomedian limits in a certain sense. Uh, and yeah, this is a, a very nice way to detect the maximality on geodesic rays as well. Uh, okay, so that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Remy. Uh, so I'm going to stop.